It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 271 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 9th of July 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi. And before we start, I'd like to thank uh, our subscribers on Patreon. Just go to scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to help us keep the show going. So I want to thank Ryan James, Dan Kruger, Brett Henry and EJ... Chris Curtin-McGee, Sean McElligott, Richard Sutherland, and Pete Ellinger. Thank you all very much for your contributions. And now let's begin with a look at concrete. And if we go back to the ancient Romans, they were using concrete to build sea walls that are still standing today, around 2,000 years later. Despite the harsh erosion from salt water that would wear away at modern concrete after only a few decades... But if anything, Penny, the Roman concrete seems to get stronger as time goes by, doesn't it? Yeah, and I didn't know this. I actually um, studied classics and archaeology and I've always been quite interested in Roman building and so on. And apparently their concrete seawalls are still standing today. And in fact, um, Pliny the Elder described their underwater concrete as structures that become a single stone mass impregnable to the waves and every day stronger, which is certainly not what happens with (laughs) modern concrete. So what I find really interesting about the Romans, and I I can't provide sources, this is all just memories of university, which was a while ago, is even though they were fantastic engineers, they didn't necessarily understand how things worked. And I remember a story about, you know, they made this fantastic concrete, they were known for it, and then they went, to, uh, I don't know, let's say Germany, but it probably wasn't Germany. And all the buildings they built started falling down because they didn't really know what they were doing. So they just said, oh, you need that red dust and this and that. And they found a rock that looked the same, but was a completely different rock, put in their concrete and it didn't work. The Roman chemical engineering labs yeah. weren't as sophisticated as They weren't as, as sophisticated as what for, we have yeah. today. Yeah. <laughs> And I think they use a really pragmatic version of how to do things. However, what's interesting is that the concrete that they were making was fantastic. So it was made with volcanic ash and lime to bind rock um, fragments together. Um, Modern concrete apparently, and I don't know a lot about concrete, but it uses a paste of water and something called Portland cement, which is a fine powder made mostly of limestone and clay, and that holds together little rock. So if you look at concrete, you can see it's not just cement. There's little chunks mm-hmm. of rock in it as well. But our modern concrete, I think most people have seen, um, you know, it's very environmentally unfriendly to make. There's a lot of emissions in its making process and it also doesn't really last. So what's going on with the Roman concrete and why doesn't it erode? Why does it gain strength in the presence of seawater? So it This is where I would have loved to be working on this. Um, One of my favourite things to do when I studied geology was look down the microscope and have a look at the different kinds of minerals that were there and go, oh, you know, what is this mineral? So in the Roman concrete, if you have a look, it contains a rare mineral called aluminium tobermorite, and there's so many minerals with such bizarre little names. I I wonder what tobermorite was named after. Um, Toblerone. That's well, my that's guess. what I kept thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so having a look at it, there was a lot of tobermorite growing through the fabric of the concrete as well as another porous mineral called philipsite. And these crystals kept growing over time when they were exposed to seawater. So essentially they're, um, when it's in the sea, um, the seawater constantly keeps these crystals growing which reinforces the concrete and prevents it from cracking. And they might also be um, quite long. Well, they are sort of long minerals, which might help it flex under pressure rather than cracking and breaking. So that's really interesting. Oh, wow. Um, so it both strengthens it and gives mm, it flexibility. Mm, that's pretty now, impressive. 
Unfortunately, you can't just go, well, great, let's just all start using Roman concrete because <laughs> the ingredients that you would need are not necessarily um, readily available. The, vol- the Romans had a lot of volcanic ash, you know, on their doorsteps, so to speak. Um, that's not true all around the world. But for certain specific uh, functions, such as seawalls or anything in the sea, it might be worth using. So using um, a kind of ash or a different recipe instead of Portland cement. So I think this is a really interesting thing. It's, um, yeah, obviously it's really hard to do a test and say, well, I wonder what we have that will last for 2,000 years. <laughs> but seeing as it has, um, to do a bit of backwards reverse engineering and find out how we can make something that strong if we need it would be fantastic. And also it would, I think, be quite environmentally good if it was used sensibly because you're not constantly replacing and having bits Mm. of it chip off and so on. It also, it kind of uh, hints at that bias that we have where we tend to think, oh, you know, the ancient civilizations, the the Romans were fantastic engineers. Mm -hmm. They were really good. They were really clever. They made this great concrete. Whereas in actual fact, they probably didn't really know what they were doing with the concrete. It just seemed to work. It just know? worked. And they just did stuff because it just worked. And, yeah, they yeah. They probably got there with trial and error and stuff. Whereas, And I'm sure there was a hell of a lot of stuff that the Egyptians and the Romans and whatever sure. did that clearly did not work and we don't see it and we don't <laughs> even think about it. So yeah. 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 That's very cool. Also, it's sort of the thing that makes me – Think about like the, surely the recipe and how they made it would have been passed down over two thousand years. Like you, you wouldn't. It's not. There wouldn't have been a complete lack of records on that sort of a thing. But you know, maybe it, it has been lost. Maybe we're sort of guessing about things like the volcanic ash. I don't know. I'm Just an sure idle you thought. could tell <laughs> where something came, where the ash came from. But I mean, if you say, mm. "Oh yeah," I would imagine it wouldn't have been the really elites writing about concrete recipes. <laughs> it's true. So it would have been, oh, go over to this mount, go to this quarry and get it, and then the quarry gets emptied, and then what do you do? Mm. Mm. Anyway. Ah, oh, very cool. Well, if someone's got a PhD thesis in there, I'd love to read. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Lucas, you were saying? Oh, I just said, hopefully by the time the quarry's empty, your empire's already fallen, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting use of the word hopefully. There. <laughs> hopefully your empire outlasts the quarry, I think is what you're saying, I think. <laughs> or no, no, no. The opposite, really. Matter, but I was thinking, um, <laughs> I was surprised to read in this story that um, the process of creating cement creates roughly 5% of global annual global mm-hmm. emissions of CO2. I, I did not realise that. That's, uh, That's huge. Intriguing. <laughs> and and concrete is so crucial to our mm. city development and urban development. You know, it's mm-hmm. not like we can just go, oh, well, back to clay, <laughs> you know. Mm. So hopefully this will be a uh, more efficient and better way to do it. Very cool. But, Lucas, let's go to the opposite end of uh, <laughs> things now and have a look at the chances of finding life on Mars, which grew even slighter this week after a study by researchers from the University of Edinburgh, which found chemicals in the Martian soil are highly toxic and would actually kill life very, very rapidly, which is a bit of a blow for those of us planning on standing on Martian soil. <laughs> um it, yeah, look, it, there are a lot of issues with standing on Martian soil <laughs> without being in a suit of some sort to protect you. But, um, but when I when I heard this story talked about on the radio and things, they were saying, you know, this is a blow to uh, plans to colonise Mars. Well, not really. We're not well, going to be is, outside, are we? <laughs> well, no, but, it, I mean, it is a blow when you think of... Um, we, you know, if we go there, we we there would a there would be a, a plan to um, eventually terraform it, and any such plan would usually start with bacteria, uh, algal sort of situation to start creating oxygen. Um, but also, the growing of food would be an issue. Yes, you can do it hydroponically, uh, but there are there are other challenges with that. Uh, one of which is potentially the availability of water which is also um, not exactly plentiful, uh, easily accessible on Mars. 
we know there's ice, there's water ice there, and we expect that there's water in the soils, but the soil's part of the problem because it's got, it does appear from our detections of, um, of the atmosphere and uh, various other um, uh, instruments and so forth, they've, they've, they've basically built an analogue of, of the Martian soil and in the lab, it looks like, um, yeah, basically the soil is quite laden with uh, uh, perchlorates. So there's chlorine containing chemical compounds, um, which we've known have been there for quite some time, but now they've done some testing with it. And what they've found essentially is that the perchlorates, uh, which are toxic anyway, they're not a big problem for, for microbes. But when you put it on Mars, which has a very thin atmosphere, um, it therefore lets a lot more UV light hit the surface mm -hmm. than, than happens here on Earth, where our atmosphere absorbs and scatters UV. Um, so what that means is you, you uh, expose these perchlorites to, to UV light, and then they basically become a micro-killing machine. Um, and, and just to put this in context, they, they did a... Um, they did some tests and, and they found that when they, let me just read this to you, the bacteria got to swim in a magnesium perchlorate solution of a similar concentration to how it is found on Mars and was then exposed to UV lights of the same general wavelength that which, um, that which bathes the Martian surface. None of the bacteria survived this test. In fact, they died within 30 seconds. Whoa. That's really quick. That's, <laughs> like, that's kind of like, you could market that on Earth as the ultimate antibacterial. That's, <laughs> that's pretty full on. So um, even without the perchlorites, though, they, they expose the same bacteria to just UV rays of this, uh, within this wavelength. And, um, and, and with just the UV rays, they, they, the entire colonies were wiped out within about a minute as well. Ah, now, we okay. know UV, UV light is used to, to decontaminate um, uh, things that are going into space and so forth. So, you know, we, already, we know this about UV light, but, you know, this, this mix means that certainly within, you know, close proximity of the surface of, of Mars, things are pretty dodgy for bacteria. And if you think of the movie, The Martian, or the book, if you read the book, mm. um, when, um, when Matt Damon's character was, was um, you know, uh, putting all of the, the bacteria f uh, via his poo into the soil um, to, to, to grow his potato crops, um, the soil would have been effectively killing the poo in that scenario so he would have had more issues than just how do i create water now i need to create this you know it's yeah some other drama <laughs> now i need to defeat poo killing martian soil now, <laughs> now i've got perchlorate problems how do i solve that mind you i fully i fully expect he would have found a way to, oh, yeah, to what he what he seemed to have it all covered so he would have figured it out but yeah i mean it's certainly it's interesting so as i say you know when, when i was reading this the, the first thing that struck me was wow that's really fast um Wow, that's really fast. Um, the, the second thing was that um, this would definitely be a problem for large-scale terraforming because um, that would inevitably start at a bacterial level and if, if your bacteria can't survive on the surface or close to the surface, well, that's an issue. That means you're kind of stuck with, with habitats and domes and so forth. Mm. Um, you could overcome the food growing problems with, you know, hydroponic solutions and stuff like that. But um, taking soil there is not really an option. So then you might have to start looking at some sort of, um, you know, chemical approach to neutralizing these perchlorites. So it all gets mm -hmm. a lot more complicated. And that's really the, the crux of this. It's just like, this is not the death knell. This is not the end of the possibilities. It's just crap. Now there's another problem we have to think <laughs> through. Um, and yeah. it'd be so much easier just not to kill Earth, I think. Um, yeah, yeah maybe we should but just... where's your sense of adventure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems pretty straightforward, um, the, the, the answer to that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, Mars not not looking great for the old terraforming thing. Generally speaking, there's a lot of issues, a lot of things. There is overcome. there is one upside to the perchlorate uh, situation on Mars, though. That means that we've put a lot of things on Mars from Earth. We've put rovers and we've put Spirit and Curiosity and Opportunity, yeah, yeah. all these things, and we're not 100 percent certain that they were completely devoid of any bacteria. Yes, 
Apparently we are now. <laughs> <laughs> the chances yeah. that they've survived. Actually, that's a good point. We, we, maybe it means that we could have driven uh, Curiosity into the uh, uh, to the area where the um, you know that we, we knew that there was water seeping through the soil to go and investigate. It was a case of well. Pfft, you know, whatever was on its surface is probably probably lasted maybe a minute. Uh, mm. <laughs> so all good. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, well, there's a silver But it's also, on. I thought it was interesting that the, the, the bacteria that they actually tested this on was a bacteria um, Bacillus uh, sub, subtilis, subtilis. Which, is a, which is known to survive on the outside of spacecraft. So this is also mm. a, an, an area bathed in UV light as a you know just in the environment so you know this it, it does okay on the outside of a spacecraft but not on the surface of mars that's that's very interesting yeah all right uh back down to earth and penny we've talked before about animals that use tools like chimpanzees or crows or even dolphins and we're all familiar with animals that make noises to attract mates but the only non-human animal that does both of those things, so it uses tools to make seductive music, is the <laughs> palm cockatoo, found mainly in New Guinea and Australia. Would you like to hear one dropping a sick drum beat? I would. So you can hear that, that knocking sound, that uh, drumming with a seed pod that the cockatoo is doing. Those high-pitched calls weren't actually from the cockatoo itself. It's just sitting on a tree banging a seed pod against it. Uh, so this is kind of cool. It's, it's actually using music to attract a mate. Is that right? Yeah, it's, I was really surprised by this because I guess if you'd asked me, you know, what animal makes music apart from humans, I would have said, I don't know. Chimps or dolphins. It, or dogs howling, maybe? Yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought of music. them using an instrument because they can't really oh, course, hold yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, interestingly, yeah, so the palm cockatoos. And, yeah, this really surprise not surprises, I don't know, I, it's something I never thought about, but this is apparently the closest that we have to human instrument use. So the palm cockatoo is quite a smart bird. Um, it's the males that do this behavior. So their first trick to, you know, attract a female is to actually get the seed pod, which is, um, apparently quite tricky and it shows off how strong their beak is. But then what they do is they hold it in their little claw and bang it rhythmically along the tree as a, um, a bit of a courtship ritual. So look sometimes at me. I he can might, hold a beat. Yeah. Yeah, look at me, I'm doing this. And he also he might make a, another sound or a whistle or and like um display his crest feathers and so on. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty cool. But what else just, I was just reading, sorry, I was just reading that <laughs> paragraph where where it was described what he does and it's uh, it's very well written. Can we can, can you read it? Do you want me to read it? Someone needs you to read, read it. this thing out loud. Holding Don't the seed or occasionally a hard seed pod with his left foot, parrots are typically left-footed, the male taps a beat on his tree perch. Occasionally he mixes in a whistle or other sounds for an impressive repertoire of around 20 syllables. As he grows more aroused, the crest feathers on his head become erect. <laughs> Spreading his wings, he pirouettes and bobs his head <laughs> deeply like an expressive pianist. He uncovers his red cheek patches, the only swathes of colour on his otherwise black body, and they fill with blood, brightening like a bush. A blush, sorry, not a bush. So I think we do have to send out props to Steph Yin from the New York Times who penned that beautiful, those beautiful words. I mean, there are lots of videos on YouTube of birds that will do courtship dances Mm -hmm. and, you know, strut their stuff uh, elaborately but well i was thinking of um bower birds but they just collect a whole lot of stuff and then dance in it (laughs) which is still cool uh, which is still cool the other thing i thought was really really interesting is this doesn't seem to be an innate behavior this um species of palm cockatoo is spread in um northern australia papua new guinea and indonesia but the drumming has only been observed in the cake York Peninsula in Australia, which suggests that it's a cultural thing. So someone or some male cockatoo has stumbled across this behaviour. It's been a success and so it's spread. So I don't know. I just 
found this really <laughs> fascinating. Well, music um, is friggin' awesome, and and, and it is amazing. Why wouldn't isn't it, it be at awesome? Yeah, why yeah. wouldn't it be as awesome too? Imagine though, because uh, when reading this, I, I started thinking about what if the larger brained dinosaurs had these sorts of things as well. Can you imagine a whole lot mm. of dinosaurs sort of jumping <laughs> around a fire, like you know, a sort of corroboree sort of thing? How cool would that have been? What sort of instruments would the dinosaurs have played? I'm sure there'd be a, a, a foot rot flats or something car- cartoon of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the Flintstones. Oh, very cool. But but also, it's it's one of those few occasions where we see tool use, use of tool for something other than just how, how do I get the food? This is a, how do I use a tool to get a mate? Uh, that's cool. Uh, shall we move on and talk about the golden record? And in 1977, the Voyager spacecraft were launched. They carried these golden records, gold plated copper phonograph records, which had images, videos, sounds, music from earth. It's a time capsule. A message from Earth to whomever or whatever may encounter it thousands of years from now. And one segment contains the sound of a man laughing. And a writer from the Atlantic, Adrienne LaFrance, made something of a mission for herself to track down who that laughing man was. Shall we have a listen to that? Yes. Yes. So, obviously, you know, there's the the, um, footprints, there's the sound of the beating heart, and then that laughing man. Penny, who who is the laughing man? How did she uh, go through this detective process to find that out? Well, I think the start of it was finding a real good recording of the laughter. Um, The NASA, apparently the one that's hosted by NASA is not the greatest quality, Um, but she realised that, um, you know, the laughter wasn't attributed to a certain person. So essentially time was running out as everyone who was involved with the making of this record ages and passes on. Um, Long story short. It is a long story. (laughs) It is quite a long story and it was really fascinating. But she contacted um, the family of the people and people who were organised, including Anne, I think, um, Drian? Andrian, yeah. Drian, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Andrian, Who who later on married Carl Sagan. Um, Is it Sagan or Sagan? I thought it was Sagan. Sagan, Sagan, yeah, yeah. And um, started to see if anyone recognised the laughter or knew who it was. And listening to it, and this is not entirely um, uncontroversial, Andrian said that listening to the laughter, she's sure it is Carl Sagan's. So the reporter then sent out emails and phone calls to sort of everyone she could who was uh, linked to that to see, to check. So listening, um, apparently he had a very distinctive laugh and his family are sure that it is his laugh. And this was a really, this is what made me, Cheer up a little bit. Apparently, um, Andrew and had told her daughter that his laugh was the very impre- first impression she had of Carl when uh, she met him in 1974, and it was included on the Voyager sound essay because she wanted it to live on forever. Mm. Which, oh. <laughs> I don't know. I just it, it's it soppy, it. but it's romantic, it's very and soppy. it's probably very accurate. It will yeah. last for, if not forever, an extremely long time. I think. Yeah. Uh, given that it's in a vacuum, it's shielded from cosmic rays and everything, there is, there's literally nothing that's really going to damage it as it travels or is now, if not in the interstellar space, very close to it. So, yeah. Yeah, it's expected that it would uh, should remain in working condition for a 
billion years. <laughs> now, was that just because it's Carl Sagan's baby? <laughs> a billion <laughs> years. <laughs> a billion, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's fairly long-term storage. We, you know, that's, that's always a challenge in the digital age is long-term storage. I, I learned a lot about the gold record reading this. I, mm. I, I, I was aware of its existence and I knew that it had things on it that were representative of, 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 of Earth and of, of what we've achieved and so forth or had achieved by then. But I, I didn't actually realise how much was on it. It's got a heap yeah. of stuff on it. Um, yeah, the, the link to this story will be in the show notes, yeah? Because mm-hmm. yep. this is, if this is of interest to people, I highly, as, as, as mm. uh, Penny said, it's a long story to read, but it was very fascinating. And I was amazed, A, how much they crammed onto this thing. Um, mm. And they did it at half the normal rate of a 78, uh, oh, no, half of a uh, 33 and a third RPM um, record. So it's basically 15 RPMs, which doubled the capacity of it. Mm. Um, but there's actually digital images recorded like preserved on this thing in on a, on a record which i didn't even you know i don't know how yeah. you yeah. describe how you yeah. would decode that um but also it has um it's got all, all, all of these uh recordings on it. it's got all sorts of music on it. it won't go through there's quite a lot of stuff on there um and then these human sounds are on there and the sounds of other animals and all sorts of other things mm. so that was really cool, but I was amazed that this kind of struck me a little bit like the, the, I think we did a story a while ago on the efforts to, to um, go through archival um, movies that, that had survived from the Apollo era and they had to build certain, um, you know, uh, equipment or rebuild or re- oh, yeah. find equipment that they could run it through. But also we learned that the original Apollo 11 movies had been recorded over. Like yep. it was just apparently the, the common policy back then that these things got reused. So they just, they don't exist anymore. It's like, yeah. what? how could they have not known how incredibly important this was historically? And that, you know, similar sort of story unfolded here where obviously not not as big a deal, but still, this is something that that you know we've sent out into space with the idea that maybe someone somewhere might find it, mm. and we 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 may we don't actually, have a copy without here. this effort. <laughs> we, yeah, we may have actually sort of lost lost the the context of what was on this thing ourselves. Mm. So you know, I I love the idea that it's Carl. Um, yeah, but but there were. You know, there were some people who worked with him that said, no, that really doesn't sound like Carl, but you'd think Anne would know of anyone <laughs> yeah. since she was the director of the project. So, but yeah, um, imagine if this effort had occurred, you know, uh, 30 years from now when Anne possibly wouldn't be with us anymore. There'd, there'd be just no one to say who this was. So I'm really glad that they, they went through this. But I think also, I mean, it surprised me that there wasn't even like an official release of this is the... yeah. The, the a copy of it for mass you know consumption sort of thing, but mm. then you got to remember this is something that uh, Carl and Anne had to actually fight to get happening. Mm. They, the, the, the original NASA administrators had wanted nothing to do with it. They we're not going to send any bits of you know Earth paraphernalia or rubbish on there. It's just excess weight. It's not going to do anything. But Carl and Anne actually fought for it and said this is going beyond our solar system. This is going out to the great beyond. We don't know who might find it. We should at least have some sort of ambassadorship on it. Yeah. But, but I think also know. beyond that, and testament to what Carl brought to space science and science generally as a communicator, is it captured the public's imagination. And that to, to think it's this long yeah. after it, and it's still such an interesting story, um, and, and you know, contrasting that with now, the, the, the you know, is this ongoing discussion we always have on this show about the 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 reduction in science funding and 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 the pressure on science to turn a profit to always mm. have a measurable outcome that is that is economical in terms. It's it's it, it, a, a part of that is because the public are not engaged and and haven't remained engaged and they've become laissez faire and they've become less. Um, a less amazed, I think, is, is, is a part of it. People just take it for granted now and they're getting so far from the technology that they rely upon every day and the people who, who create that technology, they just don't value it for what it is. And, and it's these sorts of efforts that, 
that um, engage with the public and, and get them interested and get them make them passionate that 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 are so important and and I and I you know we've got a few really great science communicators around these days who who I think you know really dedicate their lives to exactly that trying to engage the public in it so yeah I, I just I, I think that's a real tribute to Carl and Anne mm, definitely um, we, we still have things like the um, curiosity Twitter account and things like that which still I think humanize and grab people's attention about the amazing work that's being done but you're right it, it is as you say often taken for granted almost by a lot of the people which is sad but speaking of profit and making money, if you like the show today and you want to help us make more, <laughs> just go to scienceontop.com slash donate and make a donation on Patreon and then we can help spread the word to more people and make a better show. All the links uh, to the stories we talked about today are on the sh uh, show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 271. Let us know what you think, either in a comment or on social media or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Thanks Ed. This episode was edited with a lump of ancient concrete by Marcos Benamu. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. I see the climate movement in the context of the great moral crusades of the past. The abolition of slavery, the struggle for women's rights, the civil rights movement in my country and the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, and more recently, the gay rights movement. Because of a, a recognition that it was ultimately a choice between right and wrong. Well, the same thing is true of the climate movement and those other movements. Nelson Mandela once said of the anti-apartheid movement, it's always impossible until it's done. Well, now we're at that tipping point in the climate movement and people are realizing it's a choice between right and wrong. It's wrong to use the sky as an open sewer and destroy the future for the next generation.